out there, in the outlands, a man stands alone. He has two things in his hand. A cardboard box full of more cardboard and plastic, and a computer running on some kind of Wi-Fi with a Kickstarter campaign. If you look at the screen, we can see that there is a simple button that says, Do you wish to start your Kickstarter campaign? His name is Mark McKinnon. The game in his hand is Wreck and Ruin. My name is Richard, and this is We're Not Wizards, the speaking with a movie voice edition of Wreck and Ruin. <laughs> and I can't do this. You hurt your Can throat. You? <laughs> I've hurt my throat already. I've got to get a drink. This is bad. <coughs> Hi, Mark. How you doing? I'm fine, Richard. How are you? <laughs> I'm feeling good myself. We have decided tonight <laughs> we're doing a quick start on the kickstart. And in order to do something special and different, we're going to be doing up with movie voices, eh? Aren't we? Yes. Say hello. Say hello. <laughs> <laughs> we're just gonna, this is just going to descend into chaos. Um, First of all, for everybody joining us tonight, thank you for joining us. The reason that we do this is quite simply because I have one goal, which is to be able to name drop every single board game designer that has ever been into my show. And in order to do this, I have to decided to embark on a quest to speak to as many board game designers as possible. This is We Are Not Wizards. And this is probably the worst episode to start listening for us for the first time, isn't it, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> so how are you doing anyway? How's things? Enough of the nonsense, because we've got enough time for, for nonsense, but um, how how are things with you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm getting ramped up for everything over here, so yeah, fun, fun it's times. Ex- it's exciting. When yeah. you launch in? Uh, 3rd of October. So That's not that long ago at all. That's not, not long, long ago. Is it almost like is it are you is it kind kind of like there being in the same place as it was when you were expecting like your first child, except you've kind of got a due date, kind of thing. Uh, it's strange because ha- having Luke was like you know, and and building up to something you know you know when roughly when it's coming, but uh, <laughs> you know this you know. It, it was always there, but I had no idea when it was going to when it was going to pop out. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, exactly going to be happening with it and stuff like that? Because we spoke quite some time ago. Well, it wasn't that time ago, and I was thinking it must have been like the beginning of the year. And I was thinking it was something along that, and then I think, well, the beginning of the year wasn't that long ago, and then I remember that the beginning of the year was now almost 10 months ago. So that is a considerable kind of time away. Yeah, I think it's um, about April. <clears throat> yeah, maybe. something like that. I'm going to check. Let's just have a check. Here we go. There we go. It was. Wreck. This is when we used to do kind of clever um, titles for the shows. Um, but then I went back and I changed it. <laughs> so that was on... No, it was the 26th, yeah. So it was actually five months ago, which is kind of... That's pretty good. Scary but, um, stuff, yeah. Because when we spoke... You um you had the rules. We yeah. had you had pretty much ninety five percent of everything kinda done. You were still going about with the kind of the um the lovely kind of play doh esque type miniatures as well. Because it was it 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 can't have been was it it can't have been that long after or it, was it, it was, bef- bef- was it before the birth? I, I think, think it was, yeah. Yeah, before yeah. tabletop day. Yeah, it was. Because I met you, was I met, um, because I met Sarah that day, um, and I met yourself, um. And we became the Charlie's Angels, don't forget that bit. We did become the Charlie's Angels, didn't we? We came, we became the Charlie's Angels with Justin from Bad Cat Games, which is always kind of good fun. <laughs> um, and we still got the photograph somewhere, they're still horrifically three guys with, um, receding hairlines. <laughs> I don't think Justin's got it. Has Justin got a receding hairline? I don't know. He's but pro- I think my qual- receding is way, <laughs> I'm way past that. 
I'm just trying to be polite like mine because right. I look at <laughs> all I've got now is just got like more and more and more kind of face to wash and it's just quite um, disconcerting. I, sp- I think I spend more on uh, I spend more on moisturizer than I do in shampoo. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think is the way to look at it. Um, <clears throat> this is the thing when you do movie voices. It just completely, you completely makes your voice. I've, <laughs> it's not the first time I've had a tackle. <laughs> um, but I mean, since we spoke in April, I mean, what's actually what's been going? What's been happening? What you been up to? What you been doing with your good, your good, your bad self? Well, I think the the first kind of major thing that happened after that was UK Games Expo. So that was my first kind of. Well, that was my first time at the expo. You know. I was, I had a stand there, but my first time, you know, even just attending, and uh, it was completely unbelievable. You know, I I went in there as a completely wet behind the ears, and yeah. I'm like, not really sure what to expect from the whole experience. Not really sure about the reception that my game's going to get. Um, uh, I, but I just, I went down, I went down, and I actually. Peter Blenkarn was doing my models for me. He was printing them off for me. All right. Okay. And uh, I'm travelling down, and at this point, I don't, I don't even know if my models are going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, I was like, see if I have to do this whole weekend, and I have no game to show. This is going to be a disaster. <laughs> so, so the clay ones did come with me, just yeah, as a like complete emergency. But luckily, <laughs> they did not. Ha- I didn't have to break them out. <clears throat> But they are fantastic, and I hope you still got them. I have, yeah. There's, there has been suggested that I should make it some insanely priced, <clears throat> uh, you know, a one-off pledge, just because I think that, they're completely one of a kind. They don't say I've got. I wonder if you could scan them and actually make them as alternative kind of model sets as a kind of a stretch goal as time goes on, because that would be cool as well. You could have the wreck and ruin from the beginning. Kind of wreck and ruin redux, yeah, or something like that. I don't know if that's what you would. That's what you would call it. Um, so you went to the expo, and what was the what was the reception for the game? I mean, did you go down? Was it a kind of like an almost ready to go copy? Did Peter Peter to take it? Peter turned up with your vehicles. Yeah, Peter so turned what, up with the vehicles, but they they had to be resin printed, so they came out in black and grey. So. Uh, I'd went down with my paint set and oh, yeah. um, I, I had to get them painted up in the faction colours. So uh-huh. I, I managed to rope my brother in to help me and the pair of us were sitting up till one o'clock in the morning just just to give them a, a lick of paint so that they were playable the next day. And uh, yeah, and then we, woke, we got up like five hours later to oh, my goodness. to head over and get set up. So, I mean, is it, is it, is it exciting? Because you go into an exhibition because I don't, th- I think you usually do have to go a couple of hours. You have to go in, you have to get yourself, you've got to get in, so you have to get yourself set up. You have to find where you are. You have to set up all your equipment. You've got to set up your stands. You've got to get everything kind of looking right. Did you go through the, how many times did you go through the components and make sure that you had them all? <laughs> I, I checked about five times before leaving the house <laughs> and I further yeah. twice when I got there. Oh, goodness sake. And, yeah. But the, the, the feeling from Expo is just... It's such an electric atmosphere. I can't, I can't explain it. I mean, my stand, I was quite... I was basically pretty far away from the door. There was, there was one yeah. stand and then I was like the back wall. Um, but they do... They do a countdown for the people coming in, and uh, as the after the countdown, there was just this like rush of air and noise just hits you <laughs> as people as people enter, and it's just the strangest thing ever. You know that way, like you feel all the hairs and you know the back of your neck, everything just stands up. And you're like, you know, it's game time. <laughs> It's the buzz, isn't it? It's the buzz of human electricity kind of approaching you with yeah. that kind of level of power. And usually it's not just the body odour as well. Yeah, that was to and come that... later. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> and that's a joke for everybody that thinks that I think that gamers are smelly. You're not. You're all lovely. Musk is good. Um, but what was the general reaction to the game then? What what what, what kind of feedback did you get back? I mean, was there people? What was was there a kind of a big difference? Did you get kind of the very positive and the slightly less positive on the day? Um. I basically I went down with the intention of getting people to kind of sign up to my newsletter. You know, I, I didn't have anything to sell there, so it was my uh. only way of basically keeping in touch with anyone that liked the game. And yeah. I think I had everybody bar one person <laughs> signed up to it. So yeah, it was. I I didn't know what to expect. You know, are we out? I went to the press preview first in the corner, so I yeah. kind of I headed over there and then like 10 minutes to spare to rush back with my game to, to set it up for everyone else to see. Uh-huh. And I, I came back and my brother said, some of the stands just been over checking you out. And I was like, what do you mean? He says, oh, they kind of sneaked over and they were having a look at, at your models, seeing what you're doing and all that kind of stuff. But I looked at them and they just kind of scurried away. Yeah. And I was like, alright, and um yeah, I think it was Wordforge Games that do Devil's Run. Oh yeah, okay. So yeah, they were coming to have a little a little sniff. <laughs> so the the <laughs> fact that I'd got their attention I think was a kinda good sign to start with. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. if if they maybe start to sweat a little bit over there. <laughs> Which is always good. How um so you come back from the expo and you start do you just start telling people kind of straight away? Did you have an overall game plan? I mean, in that kind of that kind of five months, have you had a detailed plan of how how you're going to be doing something? Because if there's one thing we can say about yourself is, I don't think there's a week goes by without there's some kind of noise coming from the McKinnon camp, basically. Yeah. So has that been something that you've been you've decided you have to do kind of every week? Yeah, I kind of decided that right now, you know, up to that point, I wasn't really, I was kind of lurking about in the shadows. Mm. So, you know, the light was on me now and I was like, right, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to start producing something to keep people interested. Mm. And so, yeah, I decided that it started off, I think Monday was my posting day and that, yeah. that did slip pretty quickly into a Tuesday and maybe even a Wednesday, <laughs> you know, as it does. But yeah. I always try to, I would do it like a kind of, I, I post as a kind of developer diary kind of idea. Where yeah. I kind of said, you know, this is, I just kind of highlighted a section of the game, said, you know, this is what's happening or have a look at this kind of, this faction, this is what they're about or, you know, just highlight a mechanic or a bit of the lore of the game. And talk about that. Um, but then in between that, I was also getting 3D sculpt files in. So as soon as one of them came in, I was like, I must share this. You know, people have to see this. <laughs> I mean, you weren't, um, you weren't kind of very, um, secretive. I mean, I know there's a lot of, I've seen a lot of games now, whether it be because they're trying to keep a suspense or a bit of mystery. But they try and keep kind of things hidden away. And it was almost like you were, I don't know, it was, <clears throat> there was trust from your side, I think, in that the fact that you were saying, okay, here's the latest, here's the latest file with the latest kind of um, vehicle. You know, here's the scout vehicle. What do you guys think of this? Or, or here's the big rig. What do you guys think of that? Again, was that kind of, was that something you just decided to do, just to say, well, you know, if somebody's gonna if somebody's gonna copy the theme or the idea, then you know that's potentially gonna happen anyway. So I might as well just kind of show my hand and let people follow along as they kind of go. Well, as I was doing my research, one of the things that came up was the kind of yeah, the tendency to not want to tell people your idea in case they steal it. Mm-hmm. But then everybody basically said nobody has the time or inclination to basically your idea is rubbish until you do something with it. Yeah. Is the general consensus. So yeah, yeah it, it, 
like you said, if somebody's going to copy it, they're going to copy it. So all I can do is get my stuff out there to, to show people it, to, you know, hopefully get their interest. And um, even if they do copy it, it's kind of almost time-stamped, if you like, that, uh, you know, what I've done at that time. So at least there is a kind of paper trail, if you like to say, well, I did it first. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I mean, a creative person, I think it's difficult for a non-creative person to go ahead and just copy something blind. Because I think it misses out the certain factors that make that magic kind of happen in the first place. Yeah. So I could take Wreck and Ruin and I could copy it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to explain it to somebody else off the bat without having to refer to the rules and then I would look stupid. Yeah. More stupid, more stupid than normal. Um, Let's, I'm conscious we're kind of skirting, we're skirting on the outskirts of the outlands and the main issue. The re- Obviously, one of the reasons I want to get you back on is because um, this game is in- imminently going to get launched on Kickstarter very, very soon. Yes. Have the rules changed a lot, a, a lot since we last spoke? Um, Have you continued to kind of refine it? I've kind of when I started sending out to reviewers and stuff like that, there was kind of feedback coming back and just general kind of ambiguity, maybe with some of the wording in the rules. So it wasn't that the rules were bad. It was just, you know, I used the wrong word perhaps in certain sections. So my game runs on an action point system. So everything costs you an action. Mm -hmm. And made the mistake of saying, um, like, at the start of your round, at the start of a new round, the very first action that you take is that you draw an event card. And so, right, okay. So the feedback was, you know, does that cost you an action? Yeah. And I'm like, no, it's actually just because I didn't think about my wording. (laughs) So the rules themselves haven't really changed. Um, Yeah. I've, I've recently changed a rule just because of the feedback I got from Polyhedron Collider. Yes. It wasn't something that I'd, I'd actually even considered before that, mainly because I've been quite lucky that when I demo the game, it goes up to four players, and the majority of the time I have three, if not four players. Yeah. So I've, I've not had as much kind of one-on-one time with the game. Mm-hmm. And I Relatively easy fix, you know, a fix that's literally stuck in two lines of text, which fixes the problem. All right, okay. But, uh, yeah, just, you know, just little things like that, that you kind of, when you're in your own bubble, you might not think about it the same way as other people do. So, I mean... Speaking of review, I mean, you mentioned Polyhedron Collider. Hello, guys. If you're listening, I know they listen. So. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hello to John. Still my favourite. Um, Steve's my favourite as well, though. And Andy. Hello, uh, Andy. Yeah, he's all right. <laughs> he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but they, um, they had a lot of positive things to say about the game. I mean, a lot of positive things to say about the game. I think um, they kind of... Um, gushed about it a bit they were overwhelmingly positive about it I was How you surprised f- at that why? they're not that horrible <laughs> well I had a, I had a discussion with Andy the other day on, on Facebook we were talking about um, reviews and such like that and, it, and I've just flat out said to him to be honest I was a bit apprehensive about sending my game to you basically because you don't pull your punches with your reviews. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's not that I can't take the criticism, it's just that maybe didn't, you know, maybe just didn't want to hear it if it was there kind of thing, so. Oh, I think it's like, it's a difference between, um, I think it's a big difference between, you know, kind of accepting criticism when it's less permanent criticism. Because I could, you know, Okay, take it back to the expo, okay? I could play the game and I could play it for 15 minutes and then I could walk away and just say, well, this isn't for me. Yeah. And that's temporary, it's temporary criticism. 
you know, somebody could say, well, listen, I think you should have three action points instead of four because it gives you too much kind of leeway to do whatever you want. Again, it's temporary criticism. But if you've got somebody like um, Polyhedron Collider or, you know, where they write a review and maybe as well as have a review on the podcast, that's something that's kind of etched in stone. Yeah. So I guess if you kind of want your one... I guess chance, if you want your yeah. kind of one chance in the sun, you kind of you want them to be kind of more more kind of positive yeah. than you want to put your negative. best foot forward. Aye, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Have you had any other kind of review? Because this is, I guess, this is the other thing is because because you seem to be very planned and very very organised. All the reviews seem to be hitting now. There seems you don't people you don't. You seem to have it all kind of ready to go with people actually saying, well, listen, we have done a review on this and this is what we think. Have you had other reviews back from other places as well? Whenever I get a review in, I basically post and share it straight away. So um, mm. nothing else has came in, but I'm hoping that I've basically got a few more kind of lurking, shall we say. All right, okay. Right, well, I've not, I've not even seen them myself, but I know that they are due, so... Yeah. Um, unfiltered gamer. They're, um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. They're yeah. due to put something out, so that I think he's just waiting for the campaign itself. Okay. That'll um, be I spoke to Mister Leafy. Oh yeah. At gamer Leaf. <laughs> good old Blake. Yeah. Hey Blake. He's Hi, a Blake, friend how of. You doing? He, he's a good friend of the show. Hey Blake. We like Blake. If you haven't listened to Getting Gamey, uh, was it Getting Gamey with Gamer Leaf? Yes. Getting geeky with Game Relief, sorry, he's going to kill me for saying that <laughs> wrong. Give it a listen. He's he's very friend, family friendly. He brings his kids on. It's a lot of fun. He does more episodes than we do. No idea how he does it. I don't think the boy sleeps, to Guy, be perfectly honest. But the guy's an animal. <laughs> he's pretty much. I think he pretty much is. Or, or a robot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one or, one or t'other, basically. Um... Let's okay. Let's jump into the game. Let's remind everybody how you would go about. You know, not only getting a bit wrecky, but getting a bit Rooney Marky. Right, Tell me, I'm getting my game face on. Get your game face on. Put your your film voice on. The world as we know it oh. has been destroyed, leaving <laughs> nothing but a barren wasteland. From the ashes of our civilization. Four factions emerge, ready to fight over what is left. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect you to go in and actually do the voice again. <laughs> it had to be done. It had to be done. Yes. What are the names of the factions? You sounded a bit Australian there. <laughs> it's, it's my go-to. I only have one, one gen. <laughs> <laughs> my I've, only one generic voice. Yeah, one one string to my bow. <laughs> it's like me and Michael Caine. I'll try and get a Michael Caine impression in any time I can because I think it's the only one I think I can do. And then somebody pointed out that's very good, Morgan Freeman. You do. <laughs> you do do a good Michael Caine. I've got to give you that. It was better than uh, Collins. Uh, I don't know. But I'm, I'm not. Up. I'm not even going to attempt it. No, no. Go on, go on. No, no. Tell us about. Tell us about the game. Right. Because we're not doing a Frank West here. Right. <laughs> So, what we're doing is the Earth has been destroyed decades before the time that we're playing in. Uh, four factions have emerged, basically, through necessity, um, drive about in heavily armed and armoured vehicles. And what they do is they search the wasteland for what remains of our technology. So, Lost, lost technology in their time, and yeah, the the game basically revolves around the fact that you're controlling one of these factions, who have, shall we say, disagreements about who owns said property. Um, yes, tiffs. Yes, you could call them. Yes, and uh, yeah. So the game basically revolves around areas of strategic importance, which are salvage sites. They're represented on the board with tokens and you have to, on your turn, you basically have to occupy one of those tokens and that kind of represents you raiding the building, you know, 
stripping it out of the technology so that you can either repurpose it as a weapon or something that your faction can use in the future or trade it for food to, to mm-hmm. live a bit longer. So the kind of central mechanic of the game is that there are these four salvage sites which kind of attract attract attention and therefore also violence. <laughs> As they do. Yeah. So what would, <laughs> what would happen is in a in a, a four player game, well it doesn't matter how many players, it works the same, but what would happen is player one takes their turn. They use their five action points to activate their vehicles. Uh, each vehicle has a different move and attack, armor stat, all those kind of things. Kind of what you'd see in any kind of dungeon crawler, but kind of vehicleized. Yeah. Is that a word? <laughs> yeah, that's a word. Well, well it's a word, it's, it's a word now, Mark. It's a word now, yeah. It's going in the urban <laughs> dictionary. Vehicleized. <laughs> Sounds like you've had too many vehicles. He looks a bit. <laughs> he looks a bit vehicleized over there. <laughs> this is we'll have Cesar back in <laughs> doing his Somerset impression again. <laughs> uh, anyway, so you do your you yeah. Do so you've you got five actions. So yeah. what you do is you activate a vehicle to move. That would be one of your actions, basically, to move on your vehicles onto one of these tokens and any any tokens that are occupied at the start of the next player's turn basically get flipped over so they start red side up and they then get flipped to green which show that they are about to score uh-huh. so player 2 then has their turn, they've got the 5 actions as well and they then have the choice of do they chase down their own salvage sites, you know, there's another three on the table, they're not occupied yeah. or do they try and stop player one from scoring theirs, so what would happen is they have to basically damage the vehicle that's occupying uh, a green token which if they are successful, it turns it back to red which basically stops it from scoring that turn um, but it still activates again on subsequent turns, so you can decide, you know, you can damage the vehicle just enough to stop them scoring, but then yeah. it means that player three has an additional worry. Like if you occupy, if player two occupies and a, a second salvage site, there's then two turn green, so both players are potentially going to score a point. But who do they, who do they attack? You know, it then kind of, you could use it as a tactical kind of decision to say, right, I'll I'll let him stay on it, but you know, it's I don't I'm not going to bother hurting him anymore, and just let the next player deal with it. It's their problem now. Yeah. So what would happen is one of your actions that you can spend your your points on is attacking a vehicle. So each vehicle has a set number of dice that would go. So their attack value basically equals number of dice. So, for instance, uh, this second biggest vehicle is the Wrecker. Wrecker's basically, his job is to destroy everything. He's got the highest armour. So he has two choices. He can attack at range, which is basically he'll roll two dice. And any result that is equal or higher than the target's armor does damage. And of course, anyone that has seen the pictures of my game, when a vehicle takes damage, it takes damage. We take a little orange flame peg out the bag and literally stick it into the model and then it's on fire. Which is spectacular. Yes. I mean, there's no, there's no two ways about it. Is when you actually see the photographs of this, you've probably, you've probably never seen something similar in a board game, with regards to how something kind of takes damage. I mean, normally you'll have, um, if it is a dungeon crawler game, there'll be little blood 
things, counters that you put under the person to signify damage or a little heart that you take off somebody to signify damage or if it's, you know, but physically actually putting a visible damage on a, on an item is extremely evocative, especially when you get to the point, now Mark will correct me on this, but especially when you get to the point where the, the vehicle itself becomes a wreck because usually the last token that you place is like a black smoked token to just show that that thing is pre- pretty much a wreck, isn't it? Yes, that is correct. So there you go. I'm actually, yeah, I'm surprised that nobody had thought of this before. I, you know, I just assumed that it was already a thing. But yeah, like the feedback that comes back from reviewers and stuff like that is that there's no need to look over the table to to check out someone else's health tracker. Yeah. And, you know, I could have quite easily done the game with, you know, a card for each vehicle which tracked the damage on that, but it doesn't it doesn't have the same effect. No. I've seen it used in the others, I think, where you get um, little kind of heart tokens, but again, they're not on the player, they're actually on the player board, so you still have to look over and see it. But as I say, it's a very physical thing, not just having kind of a token that you put on. I've only... Where have I seen it? I've maybe... I've only seen battleships. That's the only... Yes. Yeah, I'm pretty sure maybe... There was one other game I saw that had little red tokens, but it might have just been a little kid's toy that you stuck the little red tokens at the side of it and that signified, that maybe signified damage. Um, but I've never seen it anywhere else. You can you can look up and you can see the state of the game kind of instantly because yeah. once, a, once a vehicle becomes kind of wrecked, that's when the fun kind of begins, isn't it? Yeah, so what happens is, when the, the each vehicle has a set number of peg holes, which represents the amount of damage it can do, uh, that it can take. So, for instance, uh, a buggy can it has three holes; it can take three damage. So, the vehicle will run as normal while it while it has damage, um, but it's only when the third peg goes on, which is the the final nail in the coffin. Like you said, you put in the black one, which then represents that it's wrecked. And then what happens is it crashes and burns. <laughs> crashes, burns. Yeah. Brilliant. So what happens is that when the vehicle is destroyed, it basically it was moving at high speed when it was destroyed. So it doesn't just stop, you know, just because you've killed it. It basically there's nobody at the wheel and it kind of just spins off out of control a little bit, kind of ends up randomly, you know, a couple of hexes further down the board, which is which is all right if there's nobody near it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. when you have the situation that you, the player has clumped all the vehicles together in like a protective herd, and then you take out something in the middle and whatever direction it's going, it's basically going to crash into something else. Uh, yeah, it's it's quite rewarding. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is a case of the... It's strange because when you look at the board, you see it looks like you've got like static vehicles. But it's almost a case that these are... You're kind of magnifying what's happening because the vehicles seem are kind of constantly on the move. Is the impression that I get, so that when they do end up wrecked, it's very much like um, it's kind of like any end of the last third of maybe Mad Max Two or the last one of Fury Road, where you've just got them racing across the desert and they're constantly doing that, and that's why the wrecking mechanic is so rewarding because this is it getting taken apart and it's heading towards the. Towards the tire wasteland, <laughs> and um, you know, bursting into flames, and join us for free popcorn. <laughs> um, the yeah, show was so... brought to you by <laughs> exactly, and we're sponsored today by um, no, <laughs> and no, but that's the whole point. I mean, it is kind of like almost a representation that the vehicles are kind of constantly moving back and forward, you know, fighting against each other. So when a vehicle does wreck it kind of kind of goes out of control and it's all quite kind of rewarding it's 
you've kind of designed it not to be um, particularly rules heavy in terms of what people can do, but you've brought in kind of other conditions as well in terms that you don't you don't ever wreck. You don't. You're never ever out the game. A wreck is just basically a wreck is just basically a a kind of it's a is a destroyed vehicle that hasn't had a good mechanic at it. Yes. Because you can you can bring your vehicles back in, can't you? I think that the game the game started off with no no but I knew I didn't want player elimination. That's something that I, you know yeah. it just sucks, especially if it would be you know, it could end up being quite a long game. And I found like with some of the play tests was it was in a situation where a certain player sometimes gets bullied. So they think they're smart, they move their big rig, which is their kind of biggest, strongest vehicle, onto one of the the markers, and then you find that the next two players just spend the, all their actions to just take it out. Mm-hmm. And then when a vehicle, like we said, when it's wrecked, we do the crash and burn. If you roll a one on the crash and burn table, it explodes and is removed from the table. Yeah, And it can also... When it moves as part of the crash and burn, if it moves off the edge of the table, it's also out of play. Now, previous iterations of the rules, basically, once it was off, it was off. Yeah. But I noticed then that if that happens to you in turn one, that's pretty sucky. You know, you don't, you can't really recover from something like that. No. So that's when I kind of introduced um, mechanics, basically, so that you can be down, but you'll never be out. So you can, even if it comes off the table, you can always buy it back in. But what it does is it just starts tying up your action points, which are the valuable resources that you have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, bringing a vehicle on could help you, but means that you can do less with the vehicles you already have. So it's that it's a judgment call. But it's keeping it balanced though as well because otherwise if you had kind of like player elimination then quite simply what's going to happen is you could get that gang up scenario but you end up going from a three player game down to a kind of a two and a half player game especially if somebody can't use their vehicles. Yeah. So at least with this you can kind of get back you can kind of get um, kind of people people back in the game even if they maybe have to sacrifice some moves um, they can still kind of uh, can it go back? You know, can it go back out again? Um, was it? I mean, have I mean the other thing you've well, the other thing that you've kind of brought into the game in order to kind of create a random situation um, is the event cards, which can also oh, yes. kind of trigger as well. Yeah. Oh, they are nasty. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I mean, what happens is um, the first round first round every every player basically gets a free turn where everything's nice you know the sun is shining you're getting a tan you know that way just make sure the goggles aren't sitting on top of your eyes and you know leave big white circles not looking like a panda yeah it's not pretty not big and it's not clever (laughs) but from round basically when it comes back round to player one um, they advance the round tracker to round two and they then draw an event card from the deck. And that is a global event. So what will happen is it affects player one because they are first, but it basically triggers at the start of each player's turn. So, yeah, I, I used to have it that every player could basically had the chance of drawing a different one. Yeah. And it just it made it a bit too swingy because you could have a nice card that was in play for three players turn and then four, you know, player four then gets hit with a lightning strike and you're like, you know, the other three have healed for one, you know, they've healed one damage and then player four gets hit with lightning and, uh, right, so I was like, that's not fair, we kind of do away with that. You know, it's a, it's a bit too, too swingy, so start of the round, it comes out, so I'll use, I'll use slippery surface as an example. So, Slippery Surface is a card 
that allows the previous player, so in a four player that'd be player four, they can turn any three vehicles which do not belong to them to face any other direction. So, you know, they can pick them, they can either turn one so that it makes enticing targets for other players. Yeah. So a vehicle has weaker armour in the back, so for instance, offering the back up to another opponent might prove to be too good an opportunity to miss. Yeah. Um, or they can just do it so that they're pointing them away from either their own vehicles so that they don't attack them or away from objectives. But what will happen is, yeah, player four does that to player one. But it's going to come back round and then eventually player three will do it to player four. Yeah. So, yes, it's a nice little thing which basically, although they're nasty and it's not nice that it happens to you, you get a little bit of kind of revenge on some days well, so it kind of balances it out then. Makes it a little bit sweeter sometimes. <laughs> How many rounds are you going for in a game, roughly? So the game plays up to six rounds. Um, a two-player game, I would suggest, six rounds. Um, yeah. the, the rounds are fairly quick, anyway, especially in a two-player game. Uh, a four-player game, I would suggest that this first time playing I'd suggest four um, but if you know in future games if they want to go up to six they can it basically just depends on how much time they want to play all I've wrote in the rules is that they need to agree beforehand so you don't want you know player one is winning by the end of round four and then says yeah let's just call it quits there <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Let's just finish. Yeah. That's pro- probably what Colin would do. No, pro- Colin would probably play for 16 rounds and he would still win. <laughs> you know, that's just the way, that's <laughs> just the way that he, um, the way that he kind of, he kind of plays it. In terms of, have you done a lot of playtesting with this? Has this been something which is kind of constantly at the table? And, 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 and have you been able to get it out further to kind of like different groups and stuff like that? Well, what happened with kind of prior to uh, Games Expo, I'd taken it to Compulsion, which is mm-hmm. Edinburgh, Edinburgh based. Um, I'd been to Glasgow Games Festival, and I'd also taken it to uh, Dubois for International mm-hmm. Tabletop Day. So, you did. hello guys. Hello, Dwarf. <laughs> that, does, that doesn't sound right at all. Doesn't sound right at all. <laughs> Tyrion Lannister. <laughs> oh dear, let's just not go there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, <clears throat> uh, I basically, I, I kind of, I started getting involved with a lot of groups. I was working on the game, but I don't like to walk in and say, "Hi, I'm Mark. I'm a designer." No. That'd be so funny. I I would make your dreams come true. <laughs> uh, so and you, especially if you get your if you get your teeth bleached at the same time, and then you gave him a winning smile at the end of you know, that would yeah. be absolutely excellent. So I was I was joining these groups, but I didn't want you know I didn't want to go in. That's not what I was going for. So you know I didn't want to introduce myself as that. So I kind of. Started going to all these groups, started playing with people, and then, you know, as we started getting friendly, or, you know, people say, Oh, what'd you do? And I said, Well, actually. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I, I'll just, i build up the relationships, and then if people, you know, I'd say, The game is there if anyone wants to try it, you know. Mm-hmm. If you don't want to, that's fine, you know. Some people are funny about playing games which aren't published games, because they've I don't know, they feel that it's going to be rubbish, maybe. But, uh, yeah, I, I took it to a lot of places. Those clay miniatures that I started off with, I would like to have said that they were rotated out pretty early in the process, but that would be a complete lie. <laughs> um, they, they, did, going. they did way too many conventions. They, they were a staple uh, right up to yeah, just before the expo, I was still using them, and I had I had one proper miniature, 
So I'd let them play with my handmade ones and then I'd say, but this is what I'm aiming for with the finished product. Did you have a like a little satin silk cloth that you covered it over with and then at the right time went Ta da It was in a little box and it was <laughs> backlit and when you opened it it went Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh and dear, you, that's you just, just see it was, it was like anime, you know, you could see the stars in their eyes. <laughs> Oh, I can just imagine actually folk doing that. Which one was that? Was that um, what color was that one? Uh, so that was the Reaper Scout. So he's one of the red guys. So just so what's it? One of the yeah, what's, yeah. What's the name of all the factions then? So we have four factions. You have the Salvos, um, mm-hmm. who are your kind of people who are joined together. By necessity, basically for survival. So yeah. they kind of work together to try and just eke out a meagre existence from, you know, what they can find. You then have the Reapers who are basically, they've got a bit of sunstroke. They have <laughs> been out in the sun too long. Um, Basically, people that have been pushed to to the edge, you know, with, with the kind of with the way that life is, and basically, they turned them into kind of a bit more primal than you know us civilized folk. Uh, so they're basically they're all about the death and destruction. So the actual lore for them is that they are cannibals. Oh, okay. And that they adorn their vehicles with um, the bodies of their enemies as crude crude trophies. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Yes. (laughs) I think it'd be rude if they didn't. It's just, you know, (laughs) it's just a waste of a a person, isn't it? If you just eat them and then throw the rest away, so no, I just make sure you eat the kidneys first because they taste <laughs> they taste they taste the nicest, basically. <laughs> so um, then we have yeah. the ruin army. So <clears throat> ruin there's there's no cities. All the cities have been destroyed in this um, <laughs> dystopian future. Um, but there are rumors of a <clears throat> place called ruin. Which is oh, basically right. an old abandoned uh, military installation, which is basically being repurposed, and you know people hear rumours of it and go searching for it, and then it's basically turned into this kind of shanty town round about it. But the Ruin Army are basically the protectors of that, and um, and in this situation, they're basically they leave the safety of Ruin to do supply runs. You know, bring stuff back for the people. So they are quite high-tech guys. Uh, So they've got some quite, you know, nice toys to play with. And uh, finally we have Desert Kin. So they are the other end of the scale. They are the people who have kind of shun technology in favour of kind of coexisting with the land so they have kind of a kind of symbiotic relationship with um, the wasteland and the wasteland wildlife so yeah they use animals yes. which is the best thing ever yes they're my they're my favourite so far as soon as I saw them it's like You've got animals on here, Mark. And it's like, yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, they, they've, they've proven to be quite popular. And it was a bit of a kind of, you know, it was a bit of a risky decision, I think, to make when I'm making a vehicle game to have a faction that's not vehicles. But I think it works. I, I think it's nice. It, it gives a bit of kind of, it breaks it up from being a bit too samey all the time. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of um, you kind of end up 
when you're doing a vehicle game like what you're doing, it's very easy to fall into the kind of the normal kind of tropes and stuff like that. So oh yeah, it was quite, definitely. It was really interesting. It was almost like you took it to a. It was almost like a sci-fi, Star Warsy type level, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I was kind of reminded of the Banthas out of um, A New Hope, to be honest. Definitely, so, yeah. Except for instead of Hoth, we're in Tatooine. Okay, <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I, actually the the Desert King buggy was loosely based on the lizard creature that Obi-Wan Kenobi rides in, is it Attack of the Clones? Yes. He he rides that strange lizard that kind of can run up walls and things like that? It's, it's a, I think it's called a Cryat Dragon, I think. Alright. I stand corrected. Uh, well, no, the only reason I know that is because I appeared on a podcast about three, four months ago, which was based around um, the book about um, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And so what he does, he ends up kind of making a call or shouting like one of these dragons. And I think one of them is on like Tatooine or something. So that's why I know. I'm not being a smart <laughs> ass. It's just it's one of these things that I kind of picked up in the book. <laughs> yeah, so that was definitely when I kind of pictured, when I had the, the picture in my head of what I wanted the body to look like. Um, that's kind of where I started. I was like, guy sitting on the back of a giant lizard with some kind of mounted minigun. Sounds <laughs> sounds about right. Sounds delightful. <laughs> it sounds like what every growing growing boy or growing girl needs is a, you know, it's almost right up there with sharks with lasers. Let's be perfectly honest. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, you've kind of, you've done, all the vehicles are in kind of like the faction. you got faction colours. So, I take it you're going to encourage people to paint these bad boys then? I hope so, yeah. I mean... I've actually only painted up one faction myself properly. Um, and it, it's nice, like, I had, I had, the, I've had the 3D sculpt, you know, the 3D files for a while. And you can have a look at them and, you know, you can see nice little touches on there. But I think it's not until you paint something that you appreciate, you know, the amount of work, you know, the, <laughs> The subtle touches that the artist has done. You yeah, know, absolutely. Just like the the Reaper Big Rig has skulls tied to its exhaust pipes, and it could have quite easily just stuck a couple of skulls on. But if you look at the skulls, they've actually either strap bands round them, basically tying them on, or some of them have little bits of rope that come out their eyeballs across the bridge of the nose and back into the other eyeball. That's quite disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're skulls, so they don't have eyeballs, but, you know, the sockets. But it's just the fact that, you know, that is a nice little touch that nobody would have noticed if it didn't, you know, nobody would have said, that's not tied on, you know, it's defying, yeah. it's, de- it's defying gravity. <laughs> He's glued it on. <laughs> He's using no more nails. <laughs> but yeah, when you paint it, you're like, that's really quite nice. <laughs> I like the um, I like the attention to detail that you've gone to here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, prices. Let's talk about prices. Um, because when we spoke last time, you weren't sure, kind of price wise, where you were going to be sitting. I take it with, like, obviously, um, less than a week to go, you've got an idea of what you're going to be selling it for or asking people to pledge for it at the very least. I should hope so, or else I'm not as well planned as I thought. No. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going in at £49 is going to be my my pledge, basically, for the game. Uh-huh. So I'm, at this point, I'm not thinking about add-ons or anything like that. Uh, I do have stretch goals, but the stretch goals are basically to all of them are about just improving the core game um, and adding more content to it. 
So it's already round about, I think it's about one and a half kilos or something it comes in at just now. Yeah. With the stuff that's in it, and that's that's literally not even not even insert or anything. That's just a box with some bits and baggies. Yeah. So, yeah, what I want to do is I want to basically just get more stuff into that one box so that you get it and it's you open it and you you can't close it again. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> I would then release it's a like, bigger box as an add-on. <laughs> incre- incredibly fun-filled, but once you... Um, once you punch all the cardboard out and everything like that, you can't put everything back in the box again like you, you'd like it to be. <laughs> yes. You did actually mention one of your previous shows, um, The Others, which is bad for that. Yes, it is. I'm quite... Yes, I understand putting your miniatures in big protective boxes, but if you're going to have miniatures in protective boxes, then please think about where your tokens are going to live because I've ended up having to stuff and The Others, because it Pledged really, really well and did really well on Kickstarter. You're not looking at a lot of cardboard tokens here. You're looking at a lot of plastic yes. tokens as well. So it is, yeah, it's a bit, um, it's a bit tricky to to get back in the in the old box. So forty nine pound that'll get you in the door, and that's it. You'll just be heading to see kind of what the the stretch goes. Have you decided on your funding goal at the moment? Or are you going to leave that as a surprise? <laughs> I'm a, I'm a full disclosure guy, so... Oh, I've heard. <laughs> there, there's no point in, uh, in hiding anything, because, well, these are all going to see, I'm going to post it on the, online. Uh, I think, but... uh, yeah, I know, I think it would be kind of against your nature in a sudden thing that a week before the, kind of the campaign goes live, you say, and now I'm going to start keeping secrets. Yeah. <laughs> Radio silence. Yeah. So my funding goal at the moment is looking to be twenty two thousand, and that is higher than I would have liked, especially for a first time um, yeah. designer. But it's literally the cost. It's the cost to manufacture the game. Yeah. Um, and that's it. I, I couldn't do it for any lower with the way that they. The way that the Chinese market fluctuations are just now. Yeah. Because you said that the, the prices have kind of gone up dramatically quite yes. recently. So, yeah, anyone that's not a designer probably won't know that all the kind of major players in the Chinese game manufacturers are putting a cost up by 34%. And that is going to potentially cause a lot of issues for guys that maybe are in the middle of Pledge Manager City and are waiting to get the final figures. If you have literally funded by the skin of your teeth, then you're probably in a lot of trouble right now. Which isn't great. No. Which we'll just see. So, luckily, a thread showed up on Facebook about it. Um, It was about one of the other manufacturers. And so I just thought I would double check with mine just to see mm. because a quote does only last for so long anyway so yeah, I, I wasn't expecting them to honour that but at the same time you know that way I thought look guys you know this affects how much money I need to ask for so you know let's be up front and let's talk figures yeah, and you know tell me what I need to what I need to do because I was originally hoping for around about 18,000 was where I kind of started at. Um, basically, would have covered the cost of producing the game. But um, yeah, unfortunately, I've had to put up that little bit more. But hopefully... People want a game. I mean, that's what it's going to cost, isn't it? And, yeah. You know, and it's market forces. Let's face it, people have suffered the same... Well, people have suffered a little bit of a bonus recently with the way the dollar's been, so I've heard you know, people talking about that recently. You know, back when kind of Brexit all kicked off, there was differences in how much kind of things were going to cost that way. So it's going to... It's another one of these things that, unfortunately, it's... Um, I hope it doesn't affect kind of too many, kind of too many people. 
going kind of going forward. Well, I think the, um, the one advantage that I do have is that I've I've went to these conventions. You know, people have, have tried it. The reason I went to Expo with a game that I couldn't sell was to show people that there was a product there that was worth their money. Yeah. And so, yeah, going going to something like that, and you know, for people to physically play it and say, you know. I can see the value in this. Uh, you know, they can see all, all the components, everything that comes with the game, and they say, do you know what? That That is a good price. It's, um, yeah. I mean, I've seen the game. I've seen it in its kind of original form, and uh, it's a very, very reasonable price, kind of for what you're, kind of what you're going. But, um, yeah. It's all very, very exciting, Mr. McKinnon, kind of going forward. It's all, you know, and uh, we can only wish you the best of luck from We're Not Wizards because we've kind of followed you for quite some time. So from from myself and from the Colin Meister, I hope it goes, um, I hope it kind of goes really, really well for you. I hope so too. Thanks. You know, um, if people want to track you down on the internet webs, where can they find you? I'm now going for radio silence. I'm not talking to anyone. Any, no. Uh, the best place to reach me is Facebook is the kind of best tool for conversation. Still, yeah. so I have a website which is www.wreckandruingame.co.uk. But if you want to actually speak to me and you know ask me anything about the game, um, it's facebook.com slash game. Um, I'm on Twitter, so you can chat to me on there if you want. It's just mm-hmm. wreck underscore and underscore ruin. Yeah. And then Instagram is wreck and ruin. So anything with any combination of those words will bring me, will bring you clo- one step closer to me anyway. <laughs> and we'll be putting uh, Mark's home address in the show notes if anybody wants to get that little bit closer to him. Than that. If anyone wants to be a creepy fanboy <laughs> stalker, by Not law that. I have to put my business address, which is my address, don't on, say that. on my mail. <laughs> oh, there you go. No, don't say that. Don't say that. Um, listen, Mark, thanks for coming on. Um, we've kind of kept track of you since the very, very beginning, and it's really good that um, you're about to press the button. I remember we started speaking, I think it was November October, November last year Oh yeah. so to see, see you get to this point um, I think you had a Hotmail address at that time for your Wreck and Ruin email address which was kind of cool but, um, <laughs> to see you coming on and to see you be kind of like five days before launch, it is almost like seeing one of, you know my kids start primary school it's kind of that moment, except obviously I- you won't be in a uniform and you won't be surrounded by four and five year old kids. Um, Are you getting a lump in your throat? I, I, I'm hearing you. sound like you're starting to tear up a bit. Def, I am. I'm definitely. I've probably got to go and probably blow my nose. Um, there's, a, there's something in my eye. It, it, it's so it's okay. I'm so proud. <laughs> um, if you want to keep an eye on what we're doing and we are continually surprised by everybody that does, but we are grateful for every single person that does get in contact with us. Um, I guess the first thing to say is, if you are in the situation where you are Mark like a year ago and you're starting out on Kickstarter or you've got a project out there that you're, is about to go places and you fancy um, having a chat with somebody about it, then just you know give us a shout, get in contact with us. We're always looking for... Um, we're always looking for people to chat to. Why, um, currently, why wouldn't they? Well... <laughs> See, currently, you're looking at November, which is the only thing. So anybody that's got anything going on in November, December time, give us a shout. You can get us by emailing us magic at wearenotwizards.com or .co.uk or you can hit us up on Twitter, which is We're Not Wizards. You can hit us up on Facebook, which is We're Not Wizards. You can hit us up on YouTube, which is, I think it's We're Not Wizards Tabletop um, Podcast. You can find us on Instagram, which is We Are Not Wizards, and uh, yes, you can find us all there. If you 
are liking what you're hearing and you'd like to show us some appreciation, head over to iTunes, drop a subscription because subscribing to iTunes is apparently very, very good for us because it means it puts us up and above other people and makes us very, very visible. If you like a little bit more than that, then why not drop us a review, drop us a rating. And as we say, don't give us a 10 stars because that will make us big headed. But don't give us one because that will make us cry. Give us a five. Get us in the middle. It's a bit average. The safe bet. We? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Right in the middle. And we are decidedly average. But as we say, the person that has not been average is the man who is neither a wreck or a ruin. I it's might be. Rather, <laughs> I feel like it sometimes. <laughs> it's the rather fantastic um, Mark McKinnon. Um, Mark, as I say, um, wholeheartedly, just really best of luck with the campaign. Um, been keeping up with your updates for a while. Really, really glad Polyhedron, Polyhedron Collider had some good things to say about it. It makes me very, very excited to see what's going to happen over the next kind of month for you. Um, there are only two more things to do. Um, it was three. Again, Mark, just thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I would just be second. sitting here myself talking. It would just be weird. So <laughs> it, It's me on a Tuesday night. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and the, um, the uh, well, I guess the first thing is to remember, as always, that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Mark? We are wasteland warriors, forging our own destinies. But no, we are not wizards. And the second thing is to say goodbye. So it is a goodbye from the wasteland warrior himself, Mr. Mad Mark McKinnon. (laughs) Sorry, what did that? Yeah. Goodbye, I'll see you on the wasteland. (laughs) And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. If you see a can of dog food, you better grab it. If you see a wrecker, you'd better run. This is not a safe place. This is not a place to be smiling and happy. This is a place where you will go in as a strong individual. But unless you're very careful, you will end up in wreck and ruin. And on that delightful note, until the next time, goodbye. Bye. Say goodbye.